So uh, this presentation is kind of like, um, it's, it's sort of the next step in understanding um, sort of the, the, the philosophy to how Bro acquires data and logs it and things like that. Because yesterday, you sort of learned the language, and, except for the ones that already knew it. And um, you, you learned how to look at the logs and you know, reconfigure things to a degree. Uh, the, nec the next thing is really sort of, you know, I've decided that what I'm, the logs that I'm outputting, I actually have more data that I, that I would like to see than, um, than the, the scripts currently have. But we realized that if you don't understand how these scripts are structured internally, it's sort of really hard to understand how to extend them and the points where extension can happen. This isn't really enormously deep detail. We really picked one of the simplest examples that we have, which, funny enough, is actually the SSL scripts. They're, they're, SSL is a very simple protocol. It's, it's bogged down in details. But um, the important thing is I really want to try and focus on is the script structure and when data, because it's all, it's all this data in and out. And you just have to think about where data is going into things and where data is coming out of things. So I had to, I realized also, before I could even talk about that, I had to explain some of the script layout changes in 2.0. Anyone who's run 1. Let's see, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8, 0. 0.9, 1. 0.0, you know, and so on to 1.5, you would see uh, there was a policy directory, and that was where all the .bro scripts were. And it was sort of messy because there were just lots of files, and I, I talked about that some yesterday. What, so what we did was we actually realized that we needed to reorganize these. And this, this slide is a little confusing, but if you look at uh, your prefix share bro, you're actually going to see several directories there. And there's one other directory I think I didn't, I'm not talking about. It's one called tuning. But it's sort of, I think it's in there. These are the important ones. Base, the, the one up at the top, that is not in your load path. Everything under that base directory Every single script is loaded when you start Bro. Even if you give it no options, you don't tell Bro to do anything, it loads every single script there. Um, and there, there's a lot of sort of ba really, really basic things in Bro. That's where all the like, protocol analyzers are enabled and things like that. Um, you go into the policy directory. And that is sort of, like I said yesterday, that's where we define um, uh, detections and things. Like if you go into policy protocols, you'll actually see you know, various detection things for HTTP and SMTP and a few other things. And, and SSL, for instance. The site directory is, is sort of a new concept to Bro, but it was something Robin had kind of introduced with Bro Control a while ago, but we actually pulled it back into Bro now. Uh, it's this notion of, you know, we understand that you're going to want to configure things. We tell you to configure things. We should give you a place out of the box to do that. Why would we tell you, well, you need to configure something. So open a brand new file, start working on it, and do things. It's more of like, here are these, these local files. So you see that site local.bro, you edit that. When it, if you update bro later, or if you um, do make install again, or you reinstall an RPM for when we have binaries, uh, those files won't be touched. So you can be sure, and you probably want to back them up anyway. I should say that. But you can be fairly sure that those files are sort of there, and they're your files to work with. And also, if you have other, file, other scripts you're working on, you can put them into that, that site directory. And, and then maybe load them in local.bro or something. Um, in your default bro path, so things that you wouldn't, if, if you're loading a script, you wouldn't have to say load site slash local. Site is actually in your path. So you can just say load, load local. And that's loads from there. Policy is in your path too. So you can say uh, load protocols, SSL, validate certs. And that's actually going to go into the policy directory, protocols, SSL, validate certs. Um, base is not in your path because that's already given to you. You don't have to load anything from there. Oh shit, I just explained everything. Uh, anyway, everything's loaded by default. Uh, you can actually disable that too. If, if you're slightly more hardcore and you want to do things your own way, you can turn that off. 
uh, base based not on the default row path. Um, nothing's loaded from policy by default. However, we do take the opportunity because we have a local dot bro. We sort of that's where we say this is a configuration that has worked well for us, and we recommend it to you. So it's sort of uh, you know like your default httpd.conf or something equivalent to that. Um, and that's where many of the detections the bro's doing take place. Uh, OK. So it's it really the, the local dot bro. It's really that last point that I haven't covered yet. It's really just a bunch of load statements. There's, there's not a whole lot else in there. So I wanted to hit on the SSL base scripts, because they have a really clear, fairly clean, I, I've simplified it a little bit, because there's a few details we left out, because they're, they're sort of unnecessary for learning the, the data flow. Um, but the SSL base scripts, because they're really easy. The client says hello to the server. The server says hello to the client. I mean, it's, just, it's a very easy transactional handshake between them. It's easy to pull the data out of. So I, I wanted to talk just for one last second before I get to the actual content about uh, module layout. Because we sort of moved to this idea where you can load a directory. If you load a directory in Bro 2.0, if this underscore underscore load underscore underscore dot bro file is there, that's the implicitly, implicitly loaded file if you say load protocols SSL in the, the base directory. So if you did load base protocols SSL, it says, is there this load file there? If there is, it loads that. So we're trying to move to this idea where you can sort of package functionality into this bundle and move it around and stuff. Um, Main.bro is just a convention we use. You, if you look in that underscore underscore load, you actually see it just loads the main file. It doesn't do, oh, and we also added uh, relative path loading, so you can actually load things in the path like that. Um, so anyway, there's the consts file, which is really just SSL constants, SSL versions, how they map to the, the integer representations of them. Uh, um, the, the different cipher suites, because there's a ton and a half of them. I had to dig through. Uh, I had to dig through RFCs for hours finding all of these because there are so many of them. And you get to certain ones that are officially deprecated and yet still used in network traffic an awful lot. Like the, I think the Camellia ones are actually deprecated at this point, but they're still used a lot. And then Mozilla CA list is uh, that, that last file is we auto generate Mozilla's root CA from their repository. Or it's, sorry, the root CA list. So, you know, uh, we, we generated it recently, so Diginotar is not in there. It's just not one of the ones that Bro is going to validate if something's signed by Diginotar. It will not validate that successfully. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was interesting. I did a diff, and you can actually find the commit probably somewhere in the repository where we updated that file, and you can actually see. So the, in the thing was is that when we did it, and it was a sort of, I, I found it interesting. The point when Mozilla removed Diginotar, because the diff, could, you could see it that that was gone out of our file, there were two new root CAs added. <laughs> I was, it didn't make me feel particularly good. Like, I mean, it's a long list of root CAs already. And I just was sort of, it was kind of gave me an uneasy feeling, because we only did these about a month apart. We had generated it just before the uh, Diginotar explosion. And then a month later, we redid it, and theirs was gone. And Mozilla had managed to put two extras in there during that time. Anyway, not a good feeling. <laughs> so it, it kind of comes down to this whole thing, because a lot of Bro focuses around data flow, like where, how, how data flows in memory, and how it flows to disk, and how it flows off the, off the NIC. So you have to consider you're coming to you know, this protocol, and you're like, I know nothing about the protocol. I know that it's an encryption protocol. <laughs> so the first thing you have to ask is, you know, what, what could be tracked and logged? And what, what's the point of anything that I'm doing? So I kind of realized, and I think everyone would come to this pretty quickly, OK, well, there's SSL session establishment. I actually am going to change this over time, because it's actually going to be SSL session negotiation, which is slightly different, because you can renegotiate during a session. Um, but, but right now, it's really only the initial establishment, I believe. So you start realizing, OK, 
it's connection attributes, which I'm, what I'm really doing is logging attributes of a connection. And th this isn't even exactly true since you can renegotiate. It's I'm logging attributes of the connection and the session negotiation. So then you start wondering what data is available. So you turn to this event.bif. And if you, you, I guess you could like search through your source code and find this event.bif file. And basically what that does is it says, here's the events that you can handle that are coming from you know, the cores analyzing network traffic. And it just is emitting these events to the script land. And this is saying, you know, th this basically gives you the full idea of all the data you can get from the SSL analyzer in script land. <coughs> So you start looking through it, and you start finding out, uh, and this is new. The, the, I rewrote the SSL analyzer for 2.0, and there's a lot of extra stuff included. The, the raw DIR certificate is actually included in the thing, so you get full access to the actual raw bytes of the certificate. And, and it's not even just like the host certificate. It's client certificate, the full chain of certificates from the server. So you actually get a lot of data there. So you get a timestamp you know, of like when the connection started, was, was established, the actual TCP connection, the host supports, uh, protocol version, session ID, which Robin and I talked about, I think, for 20 minutes this morning about session IDs in particular. But uh, you get the server name, the SNI thing that uh, uh, Matthias had mentioned yesterday, server certificate subject, certificate validation status, if it passed, didn't pass, why it failed, that kind of sort of stuff, the cipher suite that was negotiated. It turns out, a, a lot of times, from a logging perspective, you don't necessarily care what, what ciphers the client said, hey, I support 1,000 ciphers. That's just going to fill your logs, and it's, it's really useless data. What actually matters to you is what was negotiated between the two, so you know what the, the client and server are actually using. From a notice perspective, it may matter that you say, the client offered a null cipher. Like, why, why don't want clients offering null ciphers? We don't have a notice for this yet, and I've been meaning to add one. But yeah, I mean, you generally don't want that. If something negotiates a null cipher, you definitely don't want that. If a server says, oh, yeah, sure, I can do null, I mean, that's just not good. But generally, it's not something you need to log, because what matters is sort of what happened, not what could have happened you know, from, from the log perspective. You, you do certainly need the, the notice there to, to be more complete. So this is actually a very familiar, and, and I'm hoping that some of you become expert bro programmers, and this becomes a very, very familiar looking thing to you. This is, a, this is more or less a basic skeleton for using logging framework. And by using, I, I mean basically uh, creating a new uh, out output log. This isn't something, however, because I'm, I'm trying to just sort of talk at a, at a high level, this isn't something you need to know. Like the next exercise, this only matters from an understanding what's going on under the hood a little bit so that you can work at the higher level. Most people will never need to, to do any of this because this is actually more or less the code to, to do the SSL analysis script. But it basically is just creating that type info record was, was there an uh, exercise yesterday where you did record, you like created record types and stuff? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was in there. Um, so you're creating this info record. And we use, this is, uh, it, it's, a, it, it's nothing enforced. It's just a common thing that we do. We create these info records. So that's, that record is actually SSL colon colon info. So that's the type. We have a similar thing, HTTP info, um, SMTP info. So there, there's all these things. And we, we just sort of reuse the name just for consistency. Um, coming down here, you can actually see the connection record. You know, and the connection record is frequently, uh, whenever, whenever you handle an event like an HTTP request, you get this connection record that represents the, the connection information, the IP addresses, the ports, uh, a bunch of other data, too. We realized, though, that we had this sort of nice thing we could do. Why would we bother maintaining this separately in a table or something? Let's just, ex be, let's just add the ability to extend records and add new fields to records, which was talked about some yesterday. But let's go to the next thing. Let's make it so that to get to this info record for SSL, C dollar SSL. If you write your own script, you can say, I guess it's there. It's, it's like I handled an SSL event, C dollar SSL. And you're going to get the amount of data that's been put into it at that point in time. And you have to always consider, 
that's, that's one of the hard things about Bro is that to work with it, you have to actually know the protocol because you have to know, well, it does this first and then this and then this because everything is all time-based. Your events are going to come in in the order they, they happen. Huh? What is C? Oh, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll show that. It, that. That'll make more sense in a minute. And then there's this thing, don't worry about it too much. It's just creating the, the login stream. So you have this SSL log. And so that's also like if you want to disable that log and not have it, there's a, there's a function that you can, hand, you can do in a bro init handler that's uh, log colon colon disable stream. And you would give it SSL colon colon log, and it would turn that stream off so there's no log or anything. And let's ignore the DPD config at the bottom. You don't really need to worry about that. So the first thing you do is you've sort of defined your logging unit. Your logging unit is um, SSL negotiation. So you start saying, well, what do I want to log about that? And you're like, OK, timestamp, that connection unique ID that has been talked about some. Uh, the connection ID, which is actually a record and has the, the four tuple of the, sort, the originator host, the responder host, the originator port, responder port. Um, then you start getting into really the SSL stuff. It's like you've kind of taken care of the housekeeping. You know, you, here's the connection that it happened on. Then you start saying, what SSL version was negotiated? Not which one did the client offer, but which one did the server respond with? Because they can actually change, and the server can say, no, 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 I want to do SSL 2, I want to do SSL 3. So you, and then you have the cipher. So you have, it'll say, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of ciphers. You can, you can run on some SSL traffic and, and see all the ciphers. Uh, but it, that's the actual negotiated one. So this, the client might offer 30 ciphers, but the server comes back and says, I picked that one. And that's the one that gets logged. Uh, server name, that's from the SSL extension, the SS, SNI server name indicator SSL extension. Um, we actually pull that out and log it because it's incredibly useful. It's basically the client says, I want to talk to www.google.com. And the server, if the server comes back and says, I am star.google.com, well, that's legitimate. I mean, it's basically the server name indicator is essentially what was typed into the browser URL bar. And it's, it's only there that it was added because people wanted to be, I'm sure everyone remembers, and it seems that a lot of people had never heard about it, that. Several years ago, they added this extension so that you could do virtual hosting with multiple SSL encrypted services on a single port. So you're, you're left with that. There, there's, not, there's not a field named server name. It's, it's an SSL extension. Yeah, yeah. No, no. So, OK, I, I can explain it a little more. So SSL has this horrible mechanism for extensions where you can actually, um, and I, I forget when the extensions are set, but there's actually an event where you can get each extension that's, that's, that is added to the negotiation. And it's basically uh, that during negotiation, the client can say, I am what I am actually requesting. I'm not just requesting to negotiate SSL with anyone. I'm requesting to nego negotiate SSL <laughs> with a server that I believe is named www.google.com. Because then when the server comes back and says, here's my key, it can hand numerous keys back. And it picks based on what the client said it wanted. It, it's a way of doing virtual hosting. So you can have you know, 600 different SSL services on one single port on one single IP address. I just know that the, the virtual hosting services used to have this thing where you had to pay like a lot extra to use SSL because they couldn't do this. And you know, browsers wouldn't indicate who they wanted to talk to. So if you did SSL, you would have to use like, you know, the some hosting company's SSL certificate because they could only do one on the port. And that changed several years ago, and all the browsers supported it really quickly when they added it. So does that explain the question? Yes. Um, what the server says it is is coming in just a second. Uh, so the session ID is this other thing where you can resume sessions, where uh, you can actually uh, you know, establish this SSL session, do the key exchange, and then later on, five, five minutes later, for instance, do another HTTPS request. And there are no keys exchanged. And the log looks funny. The reason the session ID got added there 
was because what it, when I didn't have it in there, we would see these ones where there was no information. Because a lot of this information, the, the latter stuff down at the bottom, is pulled out of the SSL certificate uh, exchange. And when you resume a session, there is no exchange. So they were all null. And I was like, what's going on? And then I figured out eventually that it was just these hosts resuming old sessions. They basically just tell the server, you know, here's this ID you gave me earlier. Do you know about it? And if the server comes back and says, oh, yeah, they just sort of pick up where they left off with the SSL session they had negotiated earlier. Uh, so the subject field, the next one, it's, it's a little misleading the way that's named because you can have client certificates and stuff. But um, the subject is actually the server certificates subject. So that's where you'll have the CN value, which will be star.google.com or something like that. Um, so if you wanted to in your logs, and I think Matthias is doing something on this later, you can actually validate that you know, the thing is talking to what it thought it was talking to. Because server name comes from the client, subject comes from the server. If they don't match, you have to do a little bit of parsing currently. But if they don't match, you, know, you can start questioning what was going on. Not valid before, not valid after are just things pulled out of the X509 certificates. Well, I guess I should step back and say that. We only currently support X509 certificates in SSL traffic. Um, uh, the spec, believe it or not, the spec defines that you can use PGP certificates in SSL traffic. Didn't know that. <laughs> but uh, we do not support that. I've never seen it. So uh, I'm not terribly worried about it. But it's certainly something I probably will at least add support to notice that someone's trying to do that at some point. And then there are these two fields at the bottom that are, you can see they don't have that log attribute. So it's sort of stuff that I'm like, I need internally for something I'm trying to accomplish, but I, they don't need log. That's the, the cert is the raw host certificate, or it's the raw server certificate. And it's the actual bytes of the DIR certificate. If you print it to a file and you run like the OpenSSL uh, command line client on it, you can do you know, certificate verification and there's all sorts of stuff like that and pull the data out because it's the actual certificate. Um, and then the cert chain, because you need to do that to do full chain validation if something is like a cert signed, the, the server cert, and then someone else signed that, and you know, it leads back up to, like, did you know TAR? <laughs> or something like that. You need that whole, um, that whole chain of certificates, and it's, it works with a built-in function to be able to do validation. But we store that because we need to do it to do full certificate chain validation. So anyway, this, this sort of defines like, you know, this defines like what we decided we want to log. So you, you've kind of started off. Now, now what you're left with is just filling it up. This is sort of a silly thing. I really don't want to go into this in much detail because this isn't something you're going to have to worry about. This is just one of these things that we use to hide things from you so that when you try to do stuff, we're trying to do things and just set up your environment correctly so that you don't have to think about how messed up some of these protocols can be. So it's basically just assume that that's there. It says if C dollar SSL doesn't exist because it's got this test operator with the question mark dollar sign, it says, is that set to, to null or, or not? So it says if it's not set, let's go ahead and set it to sort of this empty, you know, nothing value for that info record. And we, we call that kind of everywhere. So you see uh, SSL client hello. That's like the first thing that happens after, in the normal case. I'm sure there's some edge case I haven't discovered yet. But in the normal case, this is the first thing that happens where the client says, hello, server. Um, the only thing that we're pulling from the client is the session ID. So what we actually do is we say, if the session ID is not all null, because uh, the, if, if the client doesn't have a session with the server, it just sends 32 null bytes, and, uh, and, and, and that's it. So it says, if it's not null, the client says, hey, I have a session I want to do something with. We go ahead and we convert the string to hex, and then we save it in that C dollar SSL session ID. And you can see, you can start to see where we get these sort of big uh, benefits from using that record extension thing. The connection record has this SSL thing in it. The syntax is so simple. You're like, I don't care. It's C dollar SSL session ID done. You know, and you just you, can, you know where the data is, and you know it's there because you're in an SSL event, so you, you know it's there. And and the next exercise will actually explain how a little bit more about how it's how that where that benefit comes from and how great that benefit is. 
So server, and then their server responds and says, hello, too. And we set the session, because if things could fail, I, I don't know, maybe we wouldn't see a client hello, and we'd only see a server hello. The session makes sure that that C dollar SSL is there, so that when you handle, it, when you handle this uh, server hello in your script, you can trust that C dollar SSL is there. Because we said, we're handling this event at priority five. So if you don't define a priority on your event, that, rec that, that C dollar SSL is there because you're doing it at priority zero, which occurs after priority five. And it, it, it's kind of this whole thing where we just want things to work for you. So from the server, we actually collect the version of SSL and the cipher. And you can see these lookups. Those are doing lookups into, into tables that are defined in that const file that has all the ciphers and the versions and stuff. So it's pretty simple. I mean, this is like literally, I actually, uh, this is directly out of the uh, SSL analyzer script, or base analysis script. So then there's this X509 certificate event. And again, priority five set session. This, those two things are not something you need to, to do or worry about. They're there. I'm trying to put them there just to explain that, that we, we put them there so that it's easier for you and there's less potential for you guys breaking something. So because the server can return this whole chain of certificates, it's like it could turn, return 20 certificates if it wanted, you have to have this chain index and chain length so you know how many certificates the server's sending and what certificate it's currently on. And chain index zero is the server certificate. It's like the, the primary one. You know, it's, it's the one that's going to say star.google.com. And then maybe the one at the end of the chain is going to say Komodo or something like that. So we save the actual certificate, the, the dir cert variable, which is a string. And it's just a byte string. So you know, it's, it's the actual certificate itself. And then we save some other stuff, uh, the subject of that certificate. The not valid before, not valid after, and it's easy stuff. It's just assignment. It, it's incredibly simple. And we say, otherwise, we want to add the certificate to the validation chain, because it means it's kind of climbing up the chain to the root cert. So we need all those other ones so we can do root certificate validation so that we can test, we can look to see if we trust it or not. <laughs> Server name extension, here you go. <laughs> There's this SSL extension event. And basically what it does is it has code, which says the code indicates what extension it is. And there are, a num there are several uh, SSL extensions, some of them which look like vulnerabilities in the protocol. But I don't know enough to, to tell, but they seem odd to me. Um, and then the value, which is not parsed, it's sort of like the raw value, because there's enough of them that I wasn't going to write it in the analyzer to parse them out and, and do things. But if you look at the, you look at actual traffic, you see if you actually rip the first six bytes, it's sort of like structure type data. You rip the first six bytes off of the value. If oh, and this is the extensions code is looking into this thing, this, into this table that's defined in the const file, and it says if it's the server name extension, then we want to rip the first six bytes off the value and save it into the server name. And the first six bytes are, are just structure type data. They're like, it's Stuff that doesn't matter, essentially. But it's, it's a constant thing. The way the structure works, this works. This is hidden away in a base script, though, so you don't have to worry about it. So and then actually, we're at the point now where we're done. We actually filled up this whole structure. And we're like, OK, we, we finished. Now what do we do? What we're actually doing here is this, there's a trick that, that's happening. Data input, because we're, we're using the assumption that when you guys write scripts, you're not worrying about this priority. Because that it's goofy syntax. Who wants to worry about that? It's just it get, makes things complicated. What we're doing is we're trying to to say we understand that and we want you to not have to worry about it. So we actually handle this event twice. Once at priority five, because we want to make sure that you can presume that C dollar SSL exists and not have some failure because something happened and it doesn't exist. But then we also want to say, if you want to add your own data to, to the record and fill it in more or, or do something else with it, we want to give you the opportunity to do something before we flush the data with log write. And we actually delete it because the certificates are there. And if you have really long standing SSL sessions, you can get in tr into trouble because you're storing the, the entire DUR certificate in memory. And that just seems like a bad idea. So we actually delete that from memory. But it's the idea where data goes in at priority five, data gets flushed at priority negative five. So when you're working, you're sitting in the middle. 
the data has already gone in, but the data hasn't gone out yet. So you can presume it's there, and also presume that it's there. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it kind of turns out to be nice. This is one of the things when I was rewriting the script 15 times. But this is something I hope you don't have to worry about. And the next, the next exercise should demonstrate it. And I, I really wanted to show this, though, because it was something that uh, we, had, we had really put a lot of attention into making sure that we had handled this right, because it's sort of, I, I wanted the experience of using these bro scripts to be really, really nice and writing your own so that we kind of are trying to help you out and not cause problems for you. Can you uh, I can a little bit. Uh, log write is, it's, it's again that stuff I was talking about yesterday, divorcing the notion of putting something in and pulling something out. The logging framework has two parts. There's writing, so you're putting something into it. And, and it's that SSL log is defined as a logging stream because we defined it with that create stream call earlier. And then we're saying it, it takes a record of the type that was associated with it in, during create stream. And really, it's, it's nice because you can just say, I don't know, just push this into the logging stream. You don't worry about it. If you want to do something with it, that's what logging filters are for. And that's where, on the other side, you can define what I meant when I put that in there was, and you could, you could have like each slash 24 or something goes into a separate log named by the slash 24 or something silly like that. Or, or um, inbounds, you know, have one that's named SSL inbound, one that's named SSL outbound, or something like that. And you, you really get this huge flexibility just by saying, here we don't care. We just put it in the logging stream, and the logging stream can deal with it however you've defined the logging stream to deal with it. But for the most part, a lot of this type of stuff, I'm not trying to teach you how to do this. I'm just trying to show you more like a, how we structured things internally to make it so you don't have to care how we structured things internally. It's a little funny to explain it, but I think that's about the right explanation. Um, what time is it? Oh, half an hour. Right. How much time do we have allocated for this? OK. Uh, so are there any questions? I mean, I, I know that was probably a lot to go through, but. I really just kind of wanted to demonstrate the fact that it, all the base scripts are, because all they're doing is logging, for, for the most part. They're really just about data input and output. It, it's how data gets put in and how it gets saved until we have enough, and then how it gets flushed out. And sort of structuring that around the way that we think people will want to work with this stuff so that it, it, the things just sort of magically work and they don't have to worry about how this is actually structured internally. Did you go over uh, how we add records to the info? Uh, or that, that's actually done in the exercise that's following. Okay. All right. um, so, so that was sort of the thing, because the, the exercise that follows this does SSL stuff. So you can actually see then how to, to, how to extend the record. But it's, It's really similar to, uh, to, to that, where it's doing redef record connection and saying, you know, let's add this info. Let's add a field named SSL of type info to the connection record. But in your case, you're just going to be saying, let's add a field named, um, you know, I, I don't know, <laughs> something of type count to the SSL info record. SSL colon colon info, correct. And uh, it, it's, it's really a pretty straightforward extension mechanism. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, it's, it, it's like the login framework just actually works that way. When it does the log write, you don't have to care For, from the base script's perspective. It says log write. Even though the base script never knew about your field, it's in there. And if when, you know, when the logging framework interprets it, it says it just reads through the full thing, even though the base script never knew about it. it it's a cool trick, and it makes it so we can implement this incredibly short stuff. Time. I wonder if I can show this real quick. There, there's one script I have that can actually create. Um, it's a, it's a, a, 
paying attention to the actual code in it, it's a two-line script, and it actually outputs PEM files that have all the certificates you've seen. It, it actually feeds the stuff into the OpenSSL command line client safely, and uh, assuming that OpenSSL command line client doesn't have actual bugs in it, but um, it feeds it in and it adds it, it, it appends it to a PEM file, so what actually happens is you can have like uh, local certificates and external certificates and have this PEM file that will have all of them in it. And it, it does some caching stuff. So it's you know, only logging a certificate every five minutes. So you could end up with duplicates and stuff. But things like that are really easy to implement. I can actually show that real quick. That, that, I guess that might be actually a good lead into the next exercise, too. Oh, whoops, that's for tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and I, I forgot this script that creates the PEM files is in Bro already, so you already have it. <laughs> I, I think I put it in there. Yeah. So it just sort of loads some files that it needs, even though you really don't have to load most of these. Um, you can see it handles the SSL established event. I don't know why I'm doing it at priority five. I don't need to. I should, probably shouldn't be even. But but really, the code that's doing the the code that's actually doing something here is it does some stuff to, you know to filter out duplicates, and then it comes in here and it says if it's a lo if the host is a lo the responder is a local address, set it to you know the string to local or remote. And then all it's doing is it's doing this insertion thing into the certs-local and search-remote.pem. And oh, sorry, that's the command. Then it uses this pipe d exec. And essentially, you're, you're echoing this value into the command. And you know, it turns out you, it takes a dir cert in, it pumps out a pem, and it appends it to the thing. And it, it actually works. Is there a way you can feed those back in? Um, well, I don't think you're going to want to do that automatically, but, uh, no, but yes, the, the, next, the next exercise directly addresses that. Okay. So um, I, I actually realized, I didn't realize this script was quite as complicated. As, I mean, it looks more complicated than it is, but I didn't realize I had done so much stuff in there. But uh, it's uncertain which one's going to be handled first. And th that's what I was saying. I didn't need to handle this at 5. I'm not sure why I did. I, I guess I'd just been writing base scripts and forgot and <laughs> kind of kept doing what I was doing. But I didn't need to handle that at priority 5 and probably shouldn't. Most of the stuff in the policy directory, so you can see the scripts. You see base, policy, site. Uh, most of the stuff in policy, I probably shouldn't. I should be handling it at 0. Probably, because most of the stuff in policy is like that last step. It's creating a notice, or it's doing something. So it's like, it's what you guys would be writing, is kind of the idea of what's in the policy directory. So you know, for instance, if someone wanted to do something like that, like, like create these PEM files of certificates, you know, that's something you would do, and you would do, be able to do it at priority zero without even worrying about priorities. Um, Yeah, so I, I think we should probably go ahead and go into the exercise because the the next exercise is really cool. Like it's it's very sort of practical, real world stuff, you know, in terms of adding trusted root CAs and things like that. Because I certainly know there's a university that we're right next to right now that wants to do that. <laughs> because they may have their own local CA and they want to trust those certificates and know about anything signed by certificates other than those certificates. So. But, but their CA, the CA they're using, is not in Mozilla's root CA list. So does, does everyone know where the exercise is to, to get to? I don't know which one it is. Uh, exercise four. Sorry, this is <laughs> based on the um, obsoleted agenda. <laughs> <laughs> 